microphone. So we're going to tell you they're not on. Bummer. We'll leave us down the road when we find out. So don't say anything, just in case. Well, it's just easier for getting everybody's faces if we're going to do introductions. <laughs> Don't be afraid, Dave. Why don't we do introductions? Uh, I'm Dave Richard with DHHS, and uh, hi, Mary. Hi, Dave. I have to talk louder because they really don't have the microphones on. So. <laughs> yeah, really, speak up, please. <laughs> Marlon Wells, <clears throat> sorry, that's real. Marlon Wells with the Exceptional Children's Assistance Center. I'm Curtis Bass with North Carolina Providers Association. Bruce Olin, a parent. Bob Hedrick with the North Carolina Providers Council. Lynn Norton Ramirez, parent. Why don't we go on that side of the room so Mary doesn't have to change her focus? I'm Tammy Gilmore with Cardinal Innovations. Andrew Monson Hummer, Cardinal Innovations. Rose Burnett, ECBA. Uh, Jesse Smatters, South America. Renee Rader, Division of Medical Assistance. Beverly Bell, DMA. Dan Guy, DHHS. Lisa Jackson, DMA. Jeff Goda, DMA. Kenneth Bussell, DMA. Regina Manley, ECBH. Kathy Ryder, parent. Katie Short, Mary Short. <laughs> Holly Riddle, Division of Mental Health, DDSAS. Sarah Potter. Go ahead. Shay, S A B E. Well, Kathy Ryder, Mental Health and Power. Judy Taylor, parent. Okay. Uh, Matthew Potter, Consumer Services. Uh, representing the North Carolina Stakeholder Engagement Group, as well as the Board of Directors at Center for Human Services and the Enrichment Center for Human Services. Stephen Plasky with Friends and Associates. John Augusta with the Human Services. Um, Peter Burns with Burns uh, and Associates. Monica Hamlin with DMA. And Ella? Ellen Perry. With people from North Carolina, rain, everything. Y'all have a few. I'm her assistant, Lynn. Great. Well, thank everybody for being here. I suspect we'll have a few more folks. I think there's a DD Council meeting that has it finished, or is it? <laughs> so maybe a couple folks might wander over from here <coughs> in other places, too. Also, um, what did you draw? Today's meeting is entirely devoted to um, talking about some of the, the information around individual budget and how we're thinking about moving forward with that and to give you uh, more detailed information than uh, we've had previously I think when we talked to, to uh, Burns Associate on the webinars because many of you have been on those webinars uh, that you guys did so um, uh, you should be it may not be familiar with faces but familiar with uh, these guys. But what, I, what I'd like to do is take take a couple of minutes to remind people uh, where we've come from, where we are, and how this fits into everything else that we're, we're trying to do and what we're going forward. And also let you know some of the other things that have been going on this week because it's important to know about um, the other meetings that have taken place as we've been walking through this process. <clears throat> First of all, uh, we are, we it began, and I, and I think in earnest began uh, back in the fall uh, with uh, really uh, significant conversations about how we wanted to readjust our developmental disability system uh, to be forward looking toward the future. Uh, in that, we said um, in, in a host of places that the, uh, the innovations waiver is a key component of that. It's not the only component of that, but a key component uh, that many people are interested in. Uh, that our goal uh, in readjusting the way we look at the DD system is one is to align it uh, more closely with what the values and goals that uh, people with disabilities and their families have been stating uh, to make sure that the system itself is responsive uh, and one that meets the needs of a, a larger group of people as we're, <clears throat> as we're going forward. In that, uh, we spent a lot of time on the road uh, with many of you in our listening sessions hearing back from folks about uh, what we would like the system to look like, what you would like the system to look like. I think our <clears throat> commitment always was we would hear everything and we would process 
most all of that through this group, um, but that we could not do everything that everybody wanted, but we would try to do the best we could to adhere to and um, and certainly respect and honor the positions that people brought forward uh, and tell you the things that we couldn't do uh, as we went forward. So that's uh, still as part of that commitment. You guys that are on this group know that we've how many times you've met, but it seems like a hundred now, but an awful lot of times that you have met um, around service definitions, around broad issues about the waiver, about how we wanted to go forward, because this has been primarily about um, the uh, innovations waiver going forward. Uh, many of the people in the audience have uh, showed up for a lot of different meetings. Um, most all of it is um, on YouTube somewhere, right? Yes, it and, is. And, uh, um, so you, you can all find right. those proceedings out there. Uh, what, what I... What we've heard from people, I think, have been pretty clear, is that the conceptual framework that we've been talking about, which is the idea of creating a waiver that, um, one, aligns with those values that we've talked about, supporting people uh, in their communities to have real lives, um, and that uh, means different things for different people, is something that folks had, had uh, caught into. We didn't we tried to avoid the, um, the, the, the five-page uh, vision statement that everybody fought over every word, but uh, the sensible values that we've all talked about. Um, we expressed a significant desire to make the waiver much more flexible. Um, I think that has been something that has been widely supported, that we've heard from folks uh, across the state that that's where we went ahead. And we have said to you that we believe the best way to create a much more flexible waiver and system is to create a, some certainty going forward about uh, the individual budgets that uh, we think is the right way to go forward. We think it's consistent with uh, self-direction. Uh, it's consistent with uh, the values that we've all talked about. Uh, it allows us, it done well, to create a system that has, is predictable in terms of our costs, but also predictable for providers and families and individuals to know how much available resources people have year to year going forward to make that happen. And the really important point, I think, that we need to continue to emphasize, to bring some confidence and predictability with the General Assembly um, as we ask them to continue to invest in our system. And that's really all of those values that are part of the conversations that uh, I think we've had. <coughs> and, and although we've, we've had some healthy and, I think, good debate in here where people have agreed and disagreed, I would say that most then we wound up on the same page at the end of it. So I hope that's what you're seeing there going forward. So where we're at today is to talk a little bit more about the mechanics. Because all of this ultimately uh, has some component of how do you look at what our currently, current system is compared to where we want to go and take that information and data and begin to make decisions about the system as, as we move forward. So that's really the conversation we're going to have today. Now, as we um, meet today, I'll tell you, for the past uh, two days prior to this, um, Burns and Associates and HSRI have been here. Uh, we've had um, internal meetings with um, DHHS leadership to just inform them in general where we've been. We've been having those conversations with the Secretary on the broad scope but to get a much more uh, uh, in-depth conversation about some of the things around individual budgeting and what that looks like and what that means, and looking at some of the uh, data points that make sense. Uh, we had, a, a, uh, I think, a very uh, good conversation with the CEOs um, of the LMEMCOs, so too many, too many uh, initials, no. the tech group, uh, yesterday, in which we essentially did a pretty high-level uh, discussion <laughs> about what we're looking at going forward, and yeah. talked about some decisions <laughs> that we have to make there. Um, we had uh, multiple hours of meetings with DHHS staff who are trying to, folks that you've been interacting with around um, this, this uh, project management how to go forward because we wanted to make sure they had an opportunity to impact, uh, to, to provide input to Burns and Association and SRI and also hear some of the other information. And then earlier today, uh, a meeting with, um, uh, I, I don't know the right word to say, but the, frankly the people that have to operationalize this on the ground at the LMEMCO level. Um, just no. to bring those folks into a, a broader conversation about that. And then today and this afternoon, uh, 
following no. up to this same kind of meeting with you um, about the information that we've been conveying. Now, I will tell you this, is that every meeting we will talk about all of the same things. There are a couple of little things that will be different about each one of those meetings because of the audience and how we have to talk to people and understand folks. Um, so I don't want you to think that you know we're hiding anything. That's why I want to make sure we tell you about those meetings that are going on. But we have the need to make sure that we're communicating to the folks that we have to communicate in all the right ways. This is the uh, first step in our conversations about some of these decisions that we will all have to make together as going forward. But the opportunity for you to understand uh, the sort of information that we're using and how we're getting there and uh, to have a real robust conversation with uh, these folks who have, um, one, are really smart and know the information really well and, uh, and can uh, respond to some of those questions. It won't be your last shot to have a conversation about that, so I want to make sure that we remind you of those. Um, uh, but it is, the, um, it is a big part of where we're headed, and we want to make sure we have this part of it. The last thing I'll say is that as we talk about individual budgets and that process, remember it is a piece of this puzzle. Um, it is not the be-all. The change we're trying to get to is a change that is rooted in uh, real self-direction principles, person-centered planning and direction, and a real partnership with families and people with disabilities about going forward. Uh, what you all know, uh, and we, we uh, have said from the very beginning, is that currently we ration resources. Um, this will still be a system that has to find a way to allocate the resources that the system has. We think this is the fair and equitable process, and that's what we're trying to get to. One that is uh, fair and equitable going forward for everybody in our system. Um, so, with that said, what I'd like to do is ask that, um, I guess, John, do you go first? Uh, John, to start out, and then uh, uh, Peter and, and uh, 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 Stephen to have the opportunity to, to really share with you some very uh, detailed information. And I, and I need to apologize. I will have to leave in a few minutes. We are um, continuing our uh, state budget process, which I'm learning, and um, I have to go to another meeting about that. But uh, we uh, thank you all again for the commitment to being here. And, it's a chance to really ask the questions and get a lot of information out of it. So with no, go ahead, John. Thank you. We, we posted a, a webinar. I think two of them. Have, have, did were all of you get a chance to, to be in that webinar? Uh, anybody else? Uh, John, we can't hear back here. <coughs> okay, sorry. I was asking um, because we had hosted yeah, a couple we'll of do that. Too. Maybe, maybe in a. Um, in the interest, because this is such detailed information, and many of the people that are here um, in the audience that maybe families and you know, people with disabilities that haven't heard some of it, would you mind if they came up to the table also to do that? And I, and I know some of our LME MCO staff have heard this a lot. Certainly get closer if you can't hear. But if you can't hear, maybe you can come up to the table. And you know, and another thing, Dave, um, we're, we're, we're going to be, be facing that direction. Yeah, yeah, come on, mm -hmm. so maybe there's some chairs on the other side, too. Or John, what, I mean, or go down, down to that end of the down. table. Yeah. Why don't we do it that way? I hate to move you around. I'll get in the back and seven out. Is that good? Yeah. Oh yeah, up at Dave's end. Okay. <laughs> <It's a> logistical. <laughs> Matthew. Matthew, can you move a chair over? Thanks. Well, in getting started, some of you participated in the webinar, and we didn't want to just jump into things without taking a moment to revisit some of the basics that we covered during that time. Try not to get now, back David to the back of spoke a lot about uh, why we're doing this and what we're going to do and all that. I wanted us to just sit for a moment around the why. What Stephen and Peter will be presenting is a lot of data uh, that, that describes uh, what the system is right now. What, it, what exactly you've been spending money on. Not to, not to what effect, we don't have information on outcomes. We just know something about what the state spends its dollars on uh, in terms of the services, the service use, and all those sorts of things. That tells us a lot. Now, if we're thinking about changing a system, before we get into what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, it's important to just pause for a moment and think about why we're going to do it. Uh, you said that what you're interested in doing is supporting people in community to have real lives. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't achieve that, then we're just we're just playing with the dollars on a spreadsheet. What, what are we doing that for? So at, 
at the bottom line here is, is that maybe we can't solve all the problems of North Carolina, but let's at least kick the ball down the road side around the idea of supporting people to have real lives in their community. And Dave also said that real lives could mean different things to different people. But, but we have to also think about, well, what do we really believe in around what a real life is? And I think we believe together in words like community inclusion or integration. Dave mentioned the idea of self-determination. These are constructs that we believe in. So, so the idea of it is, is to start with the idea of why we're doing it in terms of the lives of people with disabilities and their families. But now if you believe that, and I think we all do in this room, we also have to think about the context that we're playing in. Uh, Dave suggested he use the word ration, which, which tells me that, you know, there's a finite amount of money here. We don't have unlimited dollars in North Carolina to serve everybody, or to serve everybody in the ways they want. If we did, well, we probably wouldn't have a wait list, right? Oh, no. We probably wouldn't even be having this meeting. But the fact is, is that over time, the state spent money in ways, and we have to wonder about whether or not the state's been spending money in ways that is no. fair for everybody and efficient for everybody. So I always ask people, who in the room here is in favor of a system that's not fair? And nobody ever raises their hand. It's just the way it is. I'm wait, still waiting for the first person to raise no. their hand. And how many people really are in favor of a system that's inefficient, one that wastes money? Raise your hand. And nobody ever raises their hand for that either. And yet, when we go to states, North Carolina included, if I were to ask people, do we think the state spends money in a fair way across all of its people in need, people generally say, well, no. Right. And if I say, well, do you think the state spends money in ways where we never waste money, where we always are using public dollars wisely, people tend to say, no, we probably yeah. do waste money. We can do better. We can do better. And so if you believe that we want to create a system where people get the help that they need, then you might also believe, too, that we need to do that in a way that's fair and efficient so that we can help the most people in the state in ways that they need. So the why of it here really revolves around those core beliefs. And if we can all accept those beliefs, well, now we can move on and start talking about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Now, one other thing that Dave said, he used the phrase individualized budget. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, in the past, what has happened is you go to a meeting and people talk about what it is you need and you tell them what you need and so forth and so on and there's a discussion that unfolds and out of that comes a supports plan of some kind, oftentimes a treatment plan where you get to, you get to use a certain amount of services and, and off we run. And over a lot of years, what seems to happen from place to place is, is that each person may or may not feel their needs are being met, but when you look out over a whole system, why it's not fair from one place to another. You might find some people maybe get a little more than maybe they need, and other places people get a little less than they need. And that just seems to be the thing that happens. There's no blame here. Things get to be the way they are because they just get that way over time. So, but here we are. So the idea of an individualized supports budget is one where we want to place that in front of a person before they go to their plan meeting. And the individualized supports budget is based on an assessment of a person's need relative to other people's needs in the state. So what you're trying to do is develop a system where people who have the least amount of needs get the least amount of money, and the people who get, have the most amount of needs get the most amount. Now, any system that's based in statistics. Oh, I'm sorry. Talking about the support intensity scale. Now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the supports intensity scale. Thank you. Is the is the scale that's being used in North Carolina to do that? Now, in any system where you're using assessment and you're trying to use a head like like I've just described, why it's never the case that you're going to get everything right for everybody. 
with, right? There's always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be people that you miss on. And, and so any state has to develop what we call an exceptions process where you can get all of those folks and, and treat those folks one at a time. I know that there are people in the state that have exceptional behavioral challenges or exceptional medical needs. And many of you might know those people by their first names, right? And those fit people aren't going to fit into a best fit model like we've described. And the state of North Carolina is fully aware of that, and, and there'll be an exceptions process, no doubt. But an important element in any of this is the idea of an individual support budget that people have before they plan. The other thing Dave said, and I'll quiet down and turn it back to Stephen, was he, he reminded us and he emphasized that the supports budget is just an element, it's a tool in a larger sequence of events. Now, remember what goes on. People gain eligibility to a system. There is an assessment of some kind. In this case, it's the supports intensity scale. And based on that assessment, you're assigned to a group, a group that, that, that is illustrative of the level of need you have from less to high. After you have that assignment to a group, you have a supports budget, an individualized supports budget. You know what it is, and you go to your person-centered planning meeting where now that budget can be unbundled and you can hopefully get the supports you need to live your life. Now, <coughs> one support you get, the other thing Dave says is work, working on a waiver, has new services, some new services, some old services. Those things still have to be worked out some. But hopefully, people will have access to an array of services to meet their needs. But then, the services still have to be delivered. Folks here from the provider community, they'll be delivering those services. Now, the quality of those services will depend on how much those providers are being paid and who they hire and any number of other things. But there'll be a delivery of services. Providers will get paid, and then after that, hopefully we'll be able to see the impact of all of these events in terms of their outcomes, which ties us all the way back to the beginning of why we're doing it. Dave, I, I'm just guessing, but I'm sure that what you would love to see over the next few years is to see more people in North Carolina with disabilities having jobs. You would like to see more people in North Carolina having close friendships with people who are not paid, but people who are there just friends with in their communities. You'd like to see people be citizens of their communities where they're not just receiving services, but they're contributing back to their communities. These are the sorts of outcomes that I think everybody here agrees on. So, at the end of the day, after assessment, and after a supports budget is assigned, and after a person-centered plan is formed, and the services are delivered, those are the kinds of outcomes we'd like to see. But to get from where we are now to a system that can deliver on that in fair ways that are efficient, we have to take stock of what we're doing right now, what we're spending our dollars on right now, and what changes we have to make in terms of how we spend our dollars so that we have a better chance of achieving our goals, right? So at that, I think I can quiet down, and Stephen and Peter, who are our teammates in all of this, will be sharing with you a wealth of information that will tell you something about the money you have right now and how you spend it. But before I turn it to mm -hmm. Stephen, does anybody have any questions for me? Oh, I just, just look it over in this direction. This is you, Alan. It's so yeah. it, self-correction is so complicated. Is there easy? I mean, for self-advocate, can we make can we make it easier for people to understand self-correction? You, you, you know, Ellen, that's a great question. So you, Oh, Dave, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm looking at both of y'all. because I don't well, know. I'm, I'm going to just jump in and answer one thing. Is that I think you know, I think we all know, is that the, to follow some of the CMS guidelines about self-direction, that they say this is self-direction, become they are complicated, very yeah. difficult. What I believe, and this is one of the other things I would add to the conversation with John said, what I believe is that, that we ought to have a waiver 
that allows for everybody that's in the waiver to self-direct to the degree that they want to do that. And that if the waiver is constructed right, mm -hmm. and maybe we don't need all of the, um, the sort mm -hmm. of other hoops that we have to go through to call it self-direction, and frankly, that will be the expectation that everybody's in. So I think to your point, Ellen, if we, if we can do this right over time, and I think we can, then I believe what we do is we want to make it simpler for people to direct how their services are, are designed and how they utilize those services within the still constraints that we'll have under the federal Medicaid program. But I think we can do that. I think the only self-advocate, right, that Dave and I are on, the only two self-advocates that are directing their own services in the state right now. And, and I think and that, what Dave said, he'd like to see that change. But. But there needs to be training when they do it. It can't yeah. be just changing the verbiage or changing the rules. It needs to be training at all levels because MCOs don't know how it works, providers don't know how it works, self-advocates and families don't know how it works. We're so good. It makes I mean, it confusing. And, and, and I've been at three years now, and it's so complicated for me. Still, I have to, I mean, you, you know, um, call Andrea. <laughs> Or somebody like and, that. And, and Dave and, and, uh, and others with the state team, it's just come up in so many ways that sometimes we design a self-directed system and we make it so complicated that self-advocates feel we can't self-direct. And so it's not really self-direction. It's somebody else directing, but we call it self-direction. Uh -huh. And so I think the challenge going forward is to build a system that creates pathways for people to self-direct, but really the how it actually works we, we still have some thinking to do about all that, Ellen, but... Well... But I, I see have, Dave nodding his head up and down, so. I have ideas. Okay. So we need to talk some time, Dave. Um, I have a question that has been kind of mulling over and trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to formulate it. But it has to do with what you said with regards to somebody being told um, what their budget is beforehand and then, you know, figuring out how it's allotted later. Now, on a basic level, I agree with that. I think it makes sense. I think it's better than what we do now because, you know, it's just, here's a whole bunch of money and if you don't use it, then, you know, it just goes to waste, essentially. Oh, it goes back to the state. Well, yeah, it goes back to the state, but I would maintain that those two things are basically the same. Uh, so, uh, anyway, my point is, um, the, the only concern that I have about that, and this also relates back to what you said with regards to exceptions and things like that, but what if a person is attempting to sort of a lot their budget and there is sort of a flaw mm -hmm. in the system or in mm -hmm. assessment or <coughs> you know if anything goes through an algorithm I have no idea. If there's a flaw somewhere in there and it's clear that the person is not getting the amount of money that they need in order to create this, you know, this environment of independence, would there be an appeals process for that sort of thing? There will be a, clearly a, a process of reconsideration prior to that, and there is absolutely going to be an appeals process. In the, in the oh. Oh, I, I don't want to get it done. The, yeah, when, when you request a service, if you, if you don't have enough service, and a service is denied, you, all, you get appeal rights very clearly. But this process isn't to, to box people. It's, it's to, there should be various ways of, of being able to identify what you need and getting what you need. I get that. I just want to make sure there are the proper avenues in case something with the system doesn't work. Because frankly speaking, I have never heard of mm -hmm. a single system in anything ever that was without problems. Mm -hmm. So can I add, add um, before I walk on one more thing, Matthew? Because I think... That, what I want to say is that, again, the issues mm -hmm. around appeals and how people do reconsideration, of, mm -hmm. that's actually another conversation that we'll continue to have mm -hmm. as we go forward. 
what I don't want to do is, is uh, not have the chance to have the full amount of time to kind of go over mm -hmm. the information that, um, that I mean, Stephen and Peter are going to present because I, I think that will also help you mm -hmm. think about that. But we will make sure that we have on the agenda that conversation about the process um, that people uh, can go through. To of course. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one more question because I want to be, be respectful of Stephen and Peter. So Mary? I have just one quick question. When you speak about the exceptions and there being exceptions for medical and behavior needs, where does exception for safety and supervision fall in? Is that a medical exception or is that a behavior exception? Or should it be its own separate exception? There are individuals on this waiver who simply cannot be left unsupervised. If they were, whoever it was that left them unsupervised would be going to jail. So where does that safety that, in California it was called protective supervision, and it was that simple awareness of danger. Is the person aware of danger, and can they get themselves out of it? And it covered awareness of danger. So where does that fall in your algorithm, medical or behavior? Or do you have a safety supervision in your algorithm? Well, a couple of things. I, I'd like to think that, that in the groups that have been put together, that, that the groups would cover in great part the people that you're discussing. There's no, there, are, there are some groups that don't require 24-7 supervision and assistance for people. And there are groups that require 24-7 supervision and assistance. But along the way, if, if it seems as if that the services and supports that a person might typically get uh, are insufficient, then that needs to be, that needs to be brought up to the care coordinator and so forth and so on, and then reconsidered, and, and people get together and decide what to do. I think that in any system, whatever algorithm is, is Matthew described, Matt used the word algorithm, is put together, it, it cannot fit everybody. You, you, it's a best fit solution, which means that we hope to capture as many people as we can within the, the, the rubric, but there'll be some percentage of people that we don't we miss on. Some of them with medical challenges, some of them with behavioral challenges, and if there are others that, that people people believe fall outside the realm of the algorithm, will that be managed on a case-by-case -case basis? Well, Dave, do you have anything to, to add to that? That's pretty good. <clears throat> I, I do have a question that if you could cover today, um, the <clears throat> more the higher acuity, either, either behaviorally or medically, excuse me, <clears throat> of a person, typically they're the rate or the need to have some level of care coordination. That's one of the challenges in North Carolina. We have people that are very involved. And uh, will the funding bands designate, determine uh, where, when, when a person receives care coordination or not? And I just wondered if you can address that when you, as you go through your presentation. Can I? We do visit. We assist state, a lot of states. Uh, when you use the word care coordination, I could either interpret that to mean uh, coordinating your HDBS services within the innovations waiver, or I could interpret that as coordinating your care between the DD system and the acute care system, right. or the acute care system and the behavioral health system. So right. I want to yes. ask you back and say, yes. when you use the phrase care coordination, right. which, how are you applying that? Um, in my question, I was really uh, applying that to mean the person that's coordinating the plan of care and uh, within DD, within IDD. But okay. yes, I love your question better than, than mine. Your your answer. Uh, we that know wasn't that, an answer. That well, was a question. Well, <laughs> well, well it's not helpful. The, the fact that you're leading to uh, uh, beyond where we are today, as we know care coordination, and the fact that. Uh, uh, many of us believe that it ought to be a more integrated, holistic, uh, holistic yes, care coordination, uh, both physical health and uh, behavioral health, et cetera, uh, system. And when in your uh, resource allocation system do you have uh, uh, markers where those determinations are made 
whether somebody has it, to what, to what extent they have this broadened care coordination that would be both medical and behavioral. That would be great for you to give us some guidance on that. Can I maybe jump in? Is that I don't think that conversation has happened at this point. You know that everybody on the innovations waiver is required to have care coordination through the LMMCO and how that looks in a new world in terms of the integration with behavioral health and medical care coordination, you are well aware, as anybody else said, uh, we are still in the process of the General Assembly helping us make that decision. I'll not be good at that. Gotcha, and thank you for your extending question. Okay, with, with that, just to be respectful of time, I'm going to turn it over to my teammate, Stephen Pulowski, who will be working you through some of the data that they've collected now. This will be interesting. Thanks, Tom. Did you want to help with anything? Uh, <clears throat> just briefly, uh, what Stephen is going to present is a lot of information. You're going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. Um, <laughs> this is, as Dave pointed out, this is the first time we're going to be talking about this. It's not going to be the last time that we're going to be talking about this. But it, it tends to uh, talk about his, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but uh, it'll give you a background and resource allocation, kind of what the framework is. And then there are some uh, very uh, interesting issues that uh, uh, the state and working together with the MCOs and working together with groups like y'all uh, will have to uh, wrestle with. I mean, it, all of these are not simple answers. It's not a pure cookie cutter that goes in. Everything subject to uh, uh, to review, and Stephen does a very nice job of doing this presentation, and we'll be kicking in from time to time and adding and clarifying. In addition to John, Peter, feel free to interrupt me as well. Um, and I appreciate that introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with everybody today. We're okay. walking around with a copy of the, of the presentation we did. And this is the exact same presentation we made uh, to MCO staff earlier this morning. It's very comparable to some of the information we shared with the state and the MCO leadership over the last couple of days. Now, I've been selected, I guess, to speak at you the most today. And, and I like to hear myself talk, so I'm okay with that. But I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that what I'm talking about is the overriding thrust of this project. That's not the case. I'm going to be focusing on the units and the dollars, and that's kind of the world within which I live. But, but Dave and John did an excellent job of pointing out we're really driving off of the policy considerations. What we want the system to look like. Now, this information is going to help inform decision making, but this is not what's driving decision making. We're still talking about mm -hmm. what we want the system to look like. So, that's my kind of long winded way of saying I have a very narrow presentation regarding a very, very narrow piece of the broader ID system. Right, there's been a lot of talk already about a lot of the other initiatives that are taking place. I mean, there's some really obvious ones that stand out to me. Of course, there's a lot of consolidation that's taking place in the LMEs. There's been the conversion from LMEs to MCOs. Um, and there's a lot of work going around service definitions and, and making adjustments to those. There's the elimination of supports waiver and folding everyone into the innovations waiver. Um, there's the HCBS rule. I mean, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Resource allocation is just one piece of this. So that's what I'm talking about. And then within resource allocation, I'm only talking about one piece of this much larger puzzle. Right, so I, I'm going to be talking for a while here today. But again, it's because I'm trying to convey a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. But I, we don't want you to leave with the impression that this is what's driving all the decision-making process. So I believe everyone has a copy of my presentation. Now. And just looking at the title, to further underscore my point, I was really purposeful when I, when I called this the fiscal 2014 claims analysis to support resource allocation. We're not dictating resource allocation. It's not driving resource allocation. But it's important to know where we're at today when we're making decisions about what we want the system to work like tomorrow, right? And so that's all we're really trying to accomplish is provide some perspective on how dollars are currently being allocated. And that gives us a jumping off point for making decisions about whether or not there are to be changes to that, those current processes and procedures that are in place. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to do this legislature? Am I going to present this a legislature? Yeah. Dave Dave's will tell us where we're doing that. Okay. Sure. Like I said, I like to give myself talk. It doesn't matter to the audience. So. Um, he talks to himself a lot. I do. 
Um, so cutting up today's meeting, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Dave and John have done a better job of talking about kind of the overall vision uh, to much, with much greater eloquence than I'm able to do. Uh -huh. But I do want to emphasize a couple of points that resource allocation is a means to an end rather than an end to itself. So we talked about things like fairness and equity and sustainability. I mean, those are the goals. Resource allocation is a tool to help us achieve those goals. But the, you know, our end result here is not resource allocation. Our end result is something that's workable for the citizens of North Carolina. Um, we do want to facilitate self-determination and provide flexibility. And again, that's going to mean different things to different people. But to, we want to maximize folks' potential to have happy and successful lives in the home and community. And resource allocation is not a barrier to doing that. That is possible within a resource allocation framework. Uh, and of course, we talked already about predictability and equity. And when we're talking about equity, we always start off with the member. I mean, that's who it is we're doing these things for. But the, serve, the system also needs to be fair for providers. It needs to be fair for the state's contractors and managed care organizations. And of course, it needs to be fair to the state as well. So we're, we're trying to balance a lot of interests, always coming back to the members first and foremost. But we really want to think about fairness across the system. So in terms of what we have uh, in the balance of this packet, and Peter did steal my thunder a little bit, but what we're looking to do is to provide a little bit of a refresh on resource allocation. And John's done a great job on his webinars kind of laying that out, so I'll spend less time than he did on that. Hopefully, most of you that did were able to participate in that, and you'll um, this will just help kind of remind you what it is we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail about a resource allocation system in particular. And then from there, we're going to um, spend the, the remainder of the time, or at least the remainder of my time, talking about some of the preliminary results of the analysis we're doing on fiscal 14 claims data. Because again, I mean, when we're talking about resource allocation, we're talking about budget, so we would obviously like to know where people are starting from. So I've um, just laid out my agenda, so I'm going to skip right to slide five. And this is talking about the purpose of resource allocation. So I'm going to just spend um, 10 or 15 minutes, four or five slides, providing that refresh on, on what, what it is we're meaning when we talk about resource allocation. And again, uh, for those of you who do PowerPoint allocation, you know that there are constraints. And there's only so much real estate I have to work with. So I wanted to cram some of my thoughts into one slide. But, but again, um, this is a much broader goal. And John's already spent a lot of time on that groundwork for you. But I think if I were to bottom line it in my own terms, what we're really trying to accomplish is aligning individuals' needs with the resources that they're receiving. As I think Dave or John already said, um, we want to ensure that individuals receive what they need, not more, not less. I mean, folks want to receive the services that they need in order to have successful lives. And part of what that means is individuals with similar needs ought to have access to similar levels of service. I mean, that's part of that whole fairness issue, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't have access, your access to services should not be a function of where you live. It should be a function of what you live in. One of the other, uh, my second bullet point, we spent a lot of time, um, depending upon who it is we're talking about, uh, this issue, and that's making sure that we have tools out there for care coordinators. Obviously, the budgets provide uh, a starting point, a, a basis of conversation um, for, ha for doing an individualized plan or a person centered plan. Uh, this just makes sure that folks are coming to the table with some similar information to kind of, to kind of help start and begin and, and move in advance, I should say, that conversation. And then, of course, um, mm. because I'm a, a black and white kind of guy, I always put the uh, statutory requirement to, to move this project forward as well. The, the last thing I have to say on this slide is we're going to spend some time talking about the support needs matrix that's utilized by Cardinal Innovations because that's a resource allocation system that's working on the ground in that particular region. But I'm not suggesting that that's going to be the statewide solution. It just gives us a real basis to have the conversation. Right? When John did the webinar, he gave you a lot of charts and graphs that were conceptual in nature. This allows us to actually give you some concrete numbers. But again, I don't want folks to be left with the impression that this is going to be what will be imposed statewide. But it is a system that is in place, and it is, of course, uh, uh, been in place for a number of years and is working there in Cardinal. So slide number six is really the, the slide we typically lead off any uh, presentation about resource allocation with. And this is what we refer to as a scatter plot. And what it is we're demonstrating is the relationship between individuals' level of need and the amount of services in terms of dollars that they receive. 
So I need to start by telling you why I have four graphs on this page. <coughs> we spend a lot of time talking about level of need, but if I only had one piece of information to determine how much it costs to serve an individual, that piece of information would not be what their level of need is, it's where they live. It's always going to be more costly to serve individuals with 24 by 7 support than it is to provide services to individuals that receive intermittent support, and that's just a truism. So when we pulled the sample together for the, the supports intensity scale, as, as folks are probably aware, we did 52 or 5,300 interviews, not we, the state and its contractor, and AIDD did 52 or 5,300 CIS assessments. We had to establish a sample to determine who would get those assessments. And we broke that out by residential placement because there are differences between folks living in a residential supports. At the time, the service was home supports, and of course folks who didn't receive either of those two services. So those were our three residential categories. Residential supports, home supports, which is a service that no longer exists, non-residential, which means they didn't get either of the first two, and then within the non-residential category, we separately looked at people that were on the supports waiver at the time versus the comprehensive waiver. Yes, ma'am? Can I offer, uh, I have a question, because this is based on the old CAP MRDD service definitions. Yes. So residential supports is both children and adult in residential placements, either group homes or AFLs. Yes. Home supports was a service only available to adults. Right. And so this non-residential comprehensive number, that mm -hmm. would have been basically minor children mm -hmm. with very few adults. Mm -hmm. So um, there were, uh, and I'm going to go back and look to see whether or not this is limited to adults. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, what it was. That lab, the latter mm -hmm. point where it was true, but there, are, mm -hmm. there were a considerable number of adults that weren't receiving residential supports or home supports. That was a big population of individuals. And I appreciate that, um, that you bring up this is the old service definitions, but the reason we continue to report it out this way is because this is what the CIS sample was. But it's adults on. versus children. Of course, we're talking about fiscal 2014, and that's a different category of services. It's adults versus children. And actually, children. as you're going to see, we start limiting our analysis to adults only. Um, so we will be going back and doing similar sorts of analysis <coughs> for children, but the bulk of this packet is focused just on adults. So that's why there's four charts. And just to um, provide Kennedy, let me explain one of them a little bit more. The horizontal bar, the bar that runs from left to right, that starts at 70 and goes up to 140, has an individual's level of need based upon the CIS. The CIS yields a score called the, called the support in index. School, not in school. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. But for our purposes, just know that the average score from the nationwide population uh, for whom they, they the authors of the CIS created the tool, it's 100. So 100 is average. Folks with a score below 100 have less than average reads. Folks with, folks with a score above 100 have more than average reads. That's all fine. All that is, is, is in terms of these. And then what's running top to bottom on the vertical chart is services, and that's measured in terms of dollars. So what we would expect to see, and what I think John has a slide in that webinar presentation, you see this is what we'd like to see, this is what we see currently, and this is what we'd like to see. What we'd like to see is a greater correlation between the level of need and the amount of services that folks receive. So again, without boring you for the statistics, that line, that's the dark line that's slightly angled upwards is a regression line, and that demonstrates that there is very little correlation between the level of need and the amount of services that folks receive. And I don't say this in a disparaging way because every single state that we go into to do a resource allocation project will look very similarly. Otherwise, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have any need for moving forward with resource allocation. So, um, as, as John likes to say, it is the way it is because that's the way it is. And this is just the way the system has evolved over a great number of years. But now our task is to hopefully com not compress so much as better align levels of need with the amount of supports that folks receive. So the question becomes, how do we do that? And really, fundamentally, there's two steps. And there's a lot more to it than that. But if you think of it in two steps, the first thing we need to do is we need to establish groups of individuals. And what the state has chosen to use in order to do that is the supports intensity scale, the SIS. And that really is what the majority of the IDD systems are moving towards. There's other tools out there, I think the SIS is by far and away being used in the most, uh, most states across the country. I think folks are probably aware of the tool, but it measures 
thing, it measures frequency, duration, and type of support that individuals need in a variety of areas. So there's six domains, and then within those six domains, there's between like nine and 12 or 13 questions, asking various questions about how much support people need related to a variety of activities of, of daily living, essentially. And then there's also specific components of the CIS related to behavioral and medical needs. What the CIS does not do is by itself assign people to groups. So we still need to take CIS results, and we need to establish groups from those results. And that's what I'm laying out here on slide number eight. So this going to take me a minute to, to walk through. But for folks who remember their statistics classes, when you have a normalized distribution, you know that's going to be the bell-shaped curve, right? Which means you're going to have a preponderance of people kind of grouped together in the middle. So the CIS is very much uh, normed like an IQ test is. So the average score in an IQ test is 100. The average supports need index, or SNI in the CIS, is also 100. As I said before, people to the right of 100 have more than, more than greater than average needs. People to the left or to the lower score have less than average needs. So what we've done collectively between our two organizations is spent a lot of time taking a look at CIS results and how that correlates with the level of support folks need as well as some of their individual some of their individual on a more individualized mm. basis. And mm. from that work, we've developed this seven-level model, which is what's in effect in Florida, mm. as well as quite a few other jurisdictions. Mm. So now let me explain what this, um, how these, we use this results to group individuals. We break that bell curve into quartiles, which means we're trying to capture 25% of folks in group A. So again, group A individuals will be those with the least relative needs. I mean, everyone has needs, that's why they're on the way, but compared to the overall population, they have the least needs. Group B is the next 25% of the population. Groups D and E are the subsequent 25% of the population. Now, that's 25% based upon the norm instrument itself, right? I mean, that's the value of using a tool that's been normed nationally. Within a state, you're not necessarily going to see people at 25% because the relative needs of individuals in any program are a function of how you brought that program up. So, for example, it's yeah. historically been true that there's always been slots for folks with the most emergent needs, so you've been finding ways to serve people with the greatest needs first, and they kind of leapfrog people with less significant needs oftentimes in terms of getting enrolled. Mm -hmm. And what that means is your needs profile is higher than average because you are serving the most needy individuals. I mean, we see all kinds of distributions across states. It's a function of what your enrollment policies are. It's oftentimes a function of whether or not you have state institutions, ICMs, where people are receiving services. So what I can say is, these 25%, these, these quartiles, are based upon the overall distribution of CIS results based upon the original enrollment of the instrument. But here in the state, we actually see more people to the right side. We have a greater than average needs population. So the, the greatest number of people are in group D. Okay, quick question. Is it also fair to say that those quartiles are also influenced by um, the surroundings by way of, uh, say, infrastructure, public transportation, uh, variables like that, or is that sort of mm -hmm. not as significant as? Uh, no, the, the measure of support the, does not take that in, does not take the amount of help somebody's already getting for the help available to them to the faculty space to say, okay, here's Matthew, doesn't matter where Matthew lives, how much help does Matthew need to eat or to, to transfer or any of those kinds of things? So we're trying to take account of that. And remember, it's an interview where a few people could be sitting in the room and having a discussion with the person and reaching an agreement. So. A little bit of perspective on this very point is that in North Carolina, you have 9, 10, 12,000 people, 12,000 people on the waiver. You have 9,000 people that are not that are on the wait list that are not in the waiver. Yep. Those people, I don't know because we haven't done sisters on them, but I would suspect that over time you've had a limited number of slots available in the waiver, and there have been varying priority systems for how those people get into the waiver. Mm -hmm. It's not always first come, first serve. If you were in a state that had no institutions, and no wait list because everybody could get on the waiver, mm -hmm. you would likely be closer to 100. Mm -hmm. But if you have institutions, it might be that you're under 100. 
If you have a wait list, depending upon the policies that you have, you might be over 100. So, but why the tool is powerful is that we're not changing, we're not defining support needs against other people that are on the waiver. We're trying to categorize people in an absolute sense. Mm -hmm. And that's important because mm -hmm. we will tell you that in D, in North Carolina, there's about 36% of the people in the way, off the top of my head from what I recall, <laughs> about 36, 35, 36%. And the, often the question we get is, well, I thought you were doing quartiles. So how can you have 36% of your population? Now, the quartiles talks about the scoring of the normed tool. And, but by the, and we're only measuring the population in the waiver. So all of the filters that have to go through to define that population, the p waiver population is shifted, we say shifted to the right. Okay? So as I walk through that, you may have said, what happened to group C, for example? We went A to B to D. So as we've talked about, we use that support need index or a proxy of it. It's, it's actually technically not the, the support need index. It's a couple components of it. But we use that um, kind of guideline yeah. to establish those four groups. But then based upon work that we've done, we realize that there are folks that have needs that aren't necessarily captured in that specific component of the CIS. And those relate to, to medical and behavioral issues. So group C, as you can see, is carved out of groups A and B. So based upon the bulk of the CIS, they were, these individuals would ordinarily be categorized or assigned to, I should say, groups A or B. But because they have some significant behavioral issues in addition to those support needs, they're promoted or elevated, so to speak, to a higher level. And that's what group C is. So they would ordinarily be in A or B, but because of these behavioral issues, they're assigned to group C instead. The same concept holds true for groups F and G. Group F is for folks with what we term, for the purposes of a PowerPoint slide, extraordinary medical support needs. And group G is extraordinary behavioral support needs. So they can come from any of the four core tiles, but because of their exceptional needs related to medical or behavioral issues, they are promoted to these highest levels, group F mm -hmm. or G. Then the last thing you might notice on, on this slide is um, group H, which is actually outside of the bell curve altogether. And this gets to some of the issues that have been raised today, in fact, um, which is we are not able to build a system that is going to be right, so to speak, 100% of the time. It's just not possible. You know, we're aiming to build a system that's going to yield results that work for maybe 90% of the membership, but there's always going to be some folks that it just does not work for. You know, we hope that that's going to be you know, 5 or 10% of the population. It ought to be a small number of folks, but that's always going to be the case. And it, it's not going to be limited to medical behavior. It's going to be related, related to any needs. It could be someone who's in group A, and that group assignment for them just does not work. It could be someone in group G, and that assignment doesn't work. They can come from anywhere, but there always needs to be a mechanism for people to say, this is not working for me. You know, it's not, I'm not guaranteeing the results, but there needs to be access to some alternative process. And that's what the group H is intended to do. So, turning the page, slide nine. I just spent a lot of time talking about how we group individuals by level of need, but we're not done yet in terms of creating groups. We need to look at two other variables, and one of them uh, was brought up, and that's the issue of age. So, uh, again, to use Cardinal as an example, they have two classifications for age. People are children or people are adults. <laughs> and we actually use the age of 22 as the, uh, as the cutoff line for that. And it's for the simple purpose of that individuals up to the age of 22 are eligible to get services through the public educational system. So you're going to see how that plays out a little bit further. Uh, and, and I won't go into a lot of the, the other details around that. But, but, but kids sometimes need after school need okay. services and stuff. Agreed. So, Agreed. what are they going to do after school? We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Can I ask a question? In, in your graphs here, uh, what, what page are we on? Why is that? You're, you're, can, can you wait till we get there? You jumped ahead of me a little bit. Oh, I'm ahead of you. I'm only on slide nine. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm going to. You're just an overachiever. 
slide nine. Uh huh. Okay, so in the interest of time, I mean, we have a delineation between adults and children. There are some wrinkles to that. The age of 22 can't be a, a firm cutoff because you can mm -hmm. recuperate from high school before the age of 22, and there needs to be some mechanism for folks to avail themselves of a greater level of support. So, again, there's a lot of policy implications for a lot of what I'm talking about, and I'm not trying to gloss over those. I'm just trying to understand that I only have a half, of, a half a day to get through this. Then, in addition to level of need and age, we need to look at residential placement. For the purposes of what's in place uh, in the, the Colonel Innovations uh, original five county area, there's two categorizations. There's residential supports, and then there's everybody else, the non-residential categorization. Right? But again, that's an important distinction. And again, when we get to the, the slides that, that folks have started previewing on, then you'll see how that comes into play. So those are the three variables that we look at in terms of determining what <coughs> group people fall into. Level of need, age, residential placement. So that's step one, right? It's a two-step process. Step one is determining how we're going to group individuals. And again, our goal is to create groups that have similar individuals contained within them, but then the groups ought to be meaningfully different, right? So what that, how that plays out in practice is everybody in group A ought to be pretty similar. I mean, there's, this is a, a range, so there's always going to be a continuum. But generally speaking, we should be able to define people in group A, and they should have a lot of similarities. But then, as a group, group A ought to look different from group B, right? I mean, there's always going to be, again, people who are kind of on the cusp of being one or the other, but in general terms, we're trying to establish groups in which people are similar, and then there are differences, meaningful differences between the various groups. So, that's how, that's how groups are established. The next thing, the second step of this two-step process is developing individual budgets. So, as the header of slide 10 says, individual budgets are developed, developed for each group of members, and that, of course, is the basis for resource allocation. So I'm talking about steps. Now I guess I have sub-steps. So within building individual budgets, the first thing that we need to do is we need to build a model service package. And this will become more um, meaningful when I go through an actual example in just a moment. But suffice it to say, what we're talking about are making assumptions related to the amounts and types of support that individuals in each group need in order to meet their needs. After those assumptions, we simply price the cost of those services out based upon some fee schedule, and that gives us the total value of the individual budget. In fact, that's all it comes down to is what type of support, how much, and what's the cost of it. You do some multiplication, you're left with the budget at the end of the day. The math's not the hard part of this work. Um, and then I, I, the third bullet, the third major bullet on slide 10 is an important one, but I actually bring that up as I walk through the next two slides. So folks would turn to slides 11 and 12 for me. What I have laid out here what? is essentially the support needs matrices oh, God. Uh, used in Cardinal, or at least how they were originally constituted. There are some differences in, in the rates then versus the rates now, which are for our purposes really don't mean a whole lot. But because <coughs> my sole purpose here is to kind of walk through an example of how the individual budget is established. So on slide 11, we have two tables. The first table is for children receiving residential supports. The second table is for adults receiving residential supports. So I'm not going to walk through each of the individual rows, but I'm going to walk through one or two of them just to show you how they work. So you're going to see uh, in the leftmost column, it's labeled CIS category, there's groups A through G. And there's a couple of wrinkles that, that I don't have the time to get into in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of Cardinal. The bottom line is essentially A through G. The next column is the total budget, which is actually the sum of the work in the next several columns. So let me move right to those. So first we have residential supports. And this is, so it's, it's a residential support service and it's labeled here in North Carolina, not very creatively, residential supports is the name of the service as well. So that's what it is we're talking about, that service. So we've established the type of service, now we need to establish the amount. And because we're deep thinkers, we went with 365 days. So if folks are getting residential supports, they ought to get 365 days. So it's a pretty easy decision to be made. Then we look at the rates, and as folks uh, may or may not be aware, there's four levels, or at least there were four levels um, in residential supports, level one, level two, three, and four, and they had different rates. And again, uh, that's an important point to make because the concept of aligning with 
aligning dollars with level fee does not form in North Carolina. I mean, that's already what residential supports was aiming to do, right? You already paid higher rates for folks that you determined somehow had a greater level fee. So the level one rate, as you can see from the table, is $84. The level four rate was $159. So again, the concept of resource allocation is building upon similar principles. People with more needs need a greater level of support, and oftentimes that's more costly. But again, just talking about group A, we provided 365 days. The corresponding rate is $84 a day. You multiply the two together, and you're left with a cost of $30,700. The next thing we look at are day activities. What we provided is 30 hours per week, which is a pretty standard starting point. That's the way a lot of states think of day programs, five days per week, six hours per day. Mm -hmm. Now, the footnotes are actually an important piece of this particular table, and there's two points to be made. The first is we provided 30 hours per week, but the support need matrix only provides it for 14 weeks per year on the children's side, because the presumption is that the other 38 weeks per year that are getting services, the majority of their day is being spent in school. And then the second part of the footnote is how it is we price those services out, because there's a lot of day options available, or at least a handful of day options available here in North Carolina. You have day support group, and you have day support individual, you have that home and community support individual, you have support employment. There's a variety of meaningful day services uh, available to folks. So, um, as the footnote says, the decision was made when, when the s &M was created to for children from that at a 50-50 split between day support group and HCS individual. So I know I'm getting in a little bit of the weeds, but I, when you look at that rate of 437, that rate doesn't actually exist. It's an average rate between those two services. If you jump, so, so then for group A, you have 30 hours, and, and I'm yes, sorry. Sir. When I crammed this onto a PowerPoint slide, you can see the units column and it says hours, backslash, and then you can't read what it says. That's hours per week. That's obviously important. So 30 hours per week at a rate of 437 times 14 weeks yields a cost of $7,342. Right? So you add the two together, the residential plus day, you left with a total of $38,000, which you see on the far left hand, the second, so the far left hand column. Group A folks are assigned a budget of $38,000 if they're getting residential support. Children, um, if their children are receiving residential support. And you see that grows for a group G to $65,000, and there's this, this second G category, which I won't get into today. For adults, it works in a very similar fashion, 365 days of residential supports. A couple of differences on day program. We're still providing 30 hours per week of day, but this actually builds in a full 52 weeks because they're not in school for any portion of the year. So it assumes that they receive services 52 weeks per year, and then there was a, a little bit of difference in terms of what services they're presumed to receive. So again, the footnote will tell you what it is, but it's one-third day support group wow. versus two-thirds um, home and community support individual. If I was a service provider, I'd be raising so hell. So you'll see here for Group A, they're getting the same $30,000 for residential supports because it's the same rate regardless of whether or not it's an adult or a child. But they're getting a lot more money for day activities, $25,000, because there is no presumption that they are also getting services from the school. So you add the two of those things together. If I was the together, residential the provider, I'd be pissed. In group a, an adult in Group A receiving residential supports. To you. They're saying it costs the same for a child as an adult. So from a building a resource allocation wow. perspective, a residential is pretty straightforward because you have to provide 365 days and then 30 hours, like I said, you don't have to do 30. There's some states that go with less, but that's a pretty standard starting point. There's more moving pieces when we get to the wow. next one. Let me walk through that quick and then we can um, pause for some questions. And I'm not going to go through both of them because the only difference between the adults and children really relates to the assumptions around day program. So let me just skip to the bottom for non-residential adults. So again, you see the seven categories, A through G. I'm going to skip right to in-home support. <coughs> so this again is cut off. So units, it says hours per something. That is again hours per week. So you'll see the presumption for group A is that these individuals receive four hours of in-home support per week. And that grows with each subsequent level of B. It goes to 10 hours for group B, and 56 hours for group G. Day program is, follows the same principles as we talked about on the residential model. And then the last piece is we add respite, and that's 480 hours uh, down the line. 
So if you look at Group A, we're presuming $4,900 per year for in-home support, $25,000 per day program, mm -hmm. and $6,000 per respite. You add it all together, you get $37,000. Now I want to take a step back and return to the bullet that I skipped on uh, the previous couple of slides. And that's, we have to make assumptions in order to build an individual budget. But the specific assumptions do not constitute limits on numbers. Right? Because one of the things that people say when they see a table like this is, well, you're limiting our choice. You're saying we can't get more than four hours of this, and we can't do more than 30 hours of this. That's not the case. We have to make assumptions in order to build a budget. But in theory, what ought to happen is the individuals are given that $37,000 budget, and then they have choice in terms of how it is they use it. So if they want more in-home support than what's built in, they can access more in-home support. Now, again, this requires choices to be made because you're going to be using dollars that were assumed somewhere else for that service, which means you're going to use less than something else. But that's kind of a planning guideline. You're given $37,000 if you're group A, and then you make decisions about how you want to use those dollars. And he, so we just went over in about 45 minutes what we typically spend a half day on. Um, and I'm trying to build upon what John's already shared with you. But do you have any questions, again, about how individuals are grouped and then how budgets are established? Yes. I do. Um, I understand the whole concept of getting less money for less need. But if you're going to live in a, a residential placement, there's going to be like a base amount that's going to have to be sufficient for this person to pay some sort of rent, have food. Etc. So has that been established? Because regardless of the level of assistance, no, there's got to be <laughs> because we're only looking. At, that this is an important point. I appreciate the question. And this actually this is something that John was talking about before. What we are talking about here is limited to waiver services. So what you're referring to are room and board costs, which you can't use Medicaid funding for. So I mean, typically folks access those services through their SSI. But yeah, that's all separate and apart from this. This is just this is just related to waiver services. Okay. So the seven hundred and thirty-three dollars they get per month for SSI has to be sufficient. Well, I'm, I'm just like I mean, Medicaid will not allow you to use Medicaid dollars, so we could not use these dollars to supplement things like room and board and food costs. Most most states uh, generally leave an allotment for the individual of ten or twenty percent of that. 773 or whatever the number is today. And typically the rest of that does go to the group home provider to pay for room and board. Or other residential. For other residential, yeah. Medicaid, it's federal law. Medicaid will not pay for room and board. Could you say that again? Um, most states, most states, that, that Medicaid <coughs> is authorize the state to pay, to pay for the habilitation and the oversight and supervision of people in their placement. And so the $84, what you're talking about, is basically the staff cost for the mm -hmm. facility and transportation and those sorts of things. Room and board, by federal law, the Medicaid program cannot pay for. So most what happens in most jurisdictions is that in a residential situation, a couple of things go on. The client becomes eligible for SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and generally receives a check in the ballpark of $770 a month. Typically, the provider, and it, there are a whole different set of rules about this, will also apply if they're eligible for food stamps or supplemental nutritional assistance payments, SNAP payments. So they'll take the SNAP payment and 80, 90 percent of the SSI payment mm -hmm. and they will use that to pay for room and board and then the 20 or 30 dollars a month or 50 dollars a month, I can't do the yeah. math in my head, 65 dollars a month remains with the client to pay for uh, personal care needs and uh, whatever pocket money they have. As far as it's $65 <coughs> for SI. Residential services are operated. So. Residential services? Services operated. That's oh, oh that's okay. That's what, that's what they allow. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's typically the way that you compensate the room for it. So, I mean, a couple of other points stem from, from your question. 
And the first is what I opened with, which is we're talking about a narrow issue throughout this presentation. You're bringing up lots of other very valuable points, but that's not part of resource allocation because by federal law it can't be. We can't use Medicaid dollars for those purposes. A lot of folks wish that we could, but that's not changing anytime soon. The other thing that I, I didn't talk about um, in the interest of, of economy of time here is when we build these service packages, they don't actually apply to all services that folks can get through the waiver. And, and there's a lot of different terminology, but really what's subject to these are the more, I guess, direct care services. So it is your your residential habilitation, your day of habilitation, employment, respite, and the like. There's a variety of other services available through the Innovations Waiver, of course, things like assistive technology. And they might have their own individual limits, of course, but those other services are outside of the budget. So these budget, you would be able to access, for example, that group A person could get $37,000 of the, for lack of a better phrase, direct services, but they could also have access to other things like assistive technology over and above what the, their SNM would allow. And I think in John's webinar, I think he actually listed those two columns. There's one with the base, what we call base budget services, and the other column for non-base budget services. So those of you who saw that saw the list, the specific list of services. Yes, ma'am. Um, that was part of my question. Y'all keep saying support employment, and I don't see it on the sheet. I see day program. It's so right now, as a an assumption, supportive employment was not built into the support needs matrix, and that's ultimately going to be a policy decision when we were talking about what this ought to look like statewide. They could use dollars for supportive employment, but there was no specific assumption incorporated in the SNM for employment services. Does that make sense? So, I mean, the, now, could you repeat that? I'll, I'll, let me try, well, I'll, I'll try to repeat it, but I'll do it in a different way. So, yes, for the day program, for I mean, because that's usually what employment is a substitute for, for a day program, 30 hours are built in, and the assumption is that it would be two-thirds or 20 hours per week of day support group, and one-third or 10 hours per week of home and community support individual. So that's the assumption. But members don't have to abide by those specific assumptions. If they want to access supported employment, they can use supported employment. They're getting a budget, of, this group A individual is getting a budget of $37,000. He or she can decide to use some or most of that budget for supported employment. And I suspect that this would change significantly with the implementation of HCBS regulations. Mm. But these assumptions are based, they're old. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Why would you say that they would change the basis? Well, if someone has a choice in how they spend their time during the day, then the base assumption of how many hours they're going to be doing this or that might shift based on that. Well, they can still make that choice. What this is laying out is you can make any choice you want as long as it's, it's, it's almost like Henry Ford. You can buy any car you want as long as it's black. But no, <laughs> this is... Uh, um, this establishes the budget. You can, if people, how you allocate it within the exactly, yeah. and most people that say do mm. that do supported employment mm. tend to have fewer hours of supported employment um, in terms of paid support while they're doing something else. So there is part of the uh, planning process is going to also have to be. Um, what kind of natural supports are out there, what kind of community supports are out there, and how you're going to, to actually construct your meaningful day. So think of it this way. I was talking about the person-centered planning process. You get a budget, but then it is unbundled inside of the person-centered planning process as long as you stay in budget. Now, if it turns out, for instance, somebody wants to cash out all of their hours and do it and have all supported employment, all $37,000 in supported employment. Well, that might not work because now we might not have accounted for other health and safety needs of the individual. So there's going to have to be a balance, and the care coordinator would, would help to facilitate this process where the choices that people make get balanced against what, what people think might be health and safety concerns in a whole day and this and that. But the budget is what drives things, right? And then choice on top of it. So I mean, just. Before I get back to you, if that's okay, I'll just make two points to, to the question. I would agree with you that, as I try to lead off with, this is what's in place in Carnal. That doesn't mean what it's going to be. So yes, I think everything is open to further consideration. Whether or not there should be an employment assumption is something that folks can collectively have a conversation about. And the other thing before I forget about it um, is I want to continue to emphasize that these numbers now represent kind of planning guidelines. And we've talked before that there needs to be avenues for folks to 
request exceptions, and, and they are going to have the ability to do that. There's going to be a process, of course, and there are no guarantees that everyone's going to get everything that they ask for, but there are pro there will be processes in place for folks to say, well, I can't get what I need for $37,000. This is what I'm requesting. There will be a process to consider those additional requests. Yes, ma'am. There, there is higher education, too. Is that considered, I mean, is that considered in here? Like, higher education that for, for way for beyond the academics to and stuff like that. So I mean that would be presumably covered through a service like Home and Community Support Individual, where if you're get, having an aide attend with you through <coughs> attend the college classes with you. Yeah, I mean there are there are ways to use existing waiver services to provide support for folks who are pursuing higher education. Okay. It's interesting to note that your numbers. Day Supports is a group, right, where supported employment, which is one of the focuses of the new home and community waiver, is typically either a microenterprise or a job, and that's a one-on-one -on -one kind of activity. So I could have, for dear Katie, 30 hours of it, of it uh, or 40 hours, or what is it, 30, 40 hours, um, two-thirds day and one-third community networking, or I can have... 10 hours a week of supported employment because of the cost differential. So you're, you're giving me a budget that doesn't support the home and community focus of the waiver, which is a meaningful day with an employment focus. I'm going to try not to take it personally in terms oh. of my numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reporting what's this, in this is the ubiquitous but, you. This is the you. Exactly. you, you everyone but, here. But, but that, that's exactly right. I mean, there, within the budgets, there are different costs for different services. And in as much as that is exactly <coughs> true, you're right. That 30 hours <coughs> assumed per day could not stretch at 30 hours for employment. I mean, you could use some of the hours assumed for respite or something else. But apples to apples, yes. I mean, that's, and that's part of what choice is all about. Right, so that's why we'll go back to say, I'm not telling you that these are the numbers that are going to be statewide. I'm just telling you what's right now in operation and, in one part of the state. And the methodology that's used to construct these. So part of the, the I mean, the 30-hour assumption is a big assumption. What, how you price that service is a big assumption. And those are the kinds of things that I think that Dave is talking about, that the state's going to try to untease and figure out, and you're going to see some numbers uh, in terms of what's happening now on that. The state's going to try to untease that. The MCOs are going to try to untease that. Y'all are going to try to untease that. And what he's talking about is collaboratively you coming together. But, yeah, you're beginning. You got it. Okay. I don't like it. Well. And, 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 and because, because it goes against the home and community, spend your day like you like it. So, so in which case then we need to be very realistic that the goal of the home and community, which is a job and, and competitive employment, which is a fallacy for many of the people in, in my life, in my circle, and it is, is not possible with this funding model. So you're holding up an idea which is going to get people and parents excited, but there's no funding. And I, and I understand that. Well, but. Uh, I wouldn't quite characterize it that way, but mm -hmm. I think that what Duh. we're trying to do here is convey information so that you can reach conclusions. Right. right. <coughs> we're not going to try to solve that today. What right. we want, no. There's lots of other things in here that but we... I, I just need to point out those, and I've got one more okay, thing. Okay, if you feel... Right. I, I, just, I just need to point it out. I, I thank you, and I appreciate you letting me do that. Here, personal question from me to you. How much time in a month do you spend doing social things with a disabled person? I take my kid, I'm, I'm, you can think, I, I'm, I, I really, it's really none of my business. I take my kid to church Wednesday and Friday. We're at church, it's wonderful. Not a single person calls and says, let's go have bowling, let's go have coffee, let's go have a beer, even though we shouldn't drink. The whole premise that I'm going to use natural supports that I can't find is concerning to those of us who try and recognize that very few people spend any time with our children because they choose to, because unless you're really super focused on either fishing or chopping <coughs> wood, you got nothing to talk about with my kid. So thank you for listening. I'm just pointing out those two what I think are fallacies.
Um, my concern with the support and employment part is your assumption that people don't work that many hours when there are people with disabilities because y'all use the day program assumption, which is what most providers and most NCOs are using. Uh, everybody's working for employment first. Everybody's working for competitive right. jobs. And I think that you need to talk more on that side of the fence rather than the old stuff that's been done for 15 million years. Look at a positive movement forward to do support and employment. But I think for the, for the effort of the timeliness of the agenda, what they've done is taken information, historical information, and are telling us what that historical information is so that our future conversations, based on this understanding, yeah. we'll say all that. Yeah. See, good. Oh, way to back his own EMCO. Just to piggyback off of that. Mm -hmm. um, That's right, the closed provider network. I'm looking at this as there needs to be bench framework or a baseline with which we or anybody else can look at these numbers and figure out the issues with them. There's no way to figure out the issues with the numbers unless we had numbers to look at. And so, as I understand it, the only purpose of these numbers is to create that framework or that baseline that we, that the state, that Dave, that whoever else, the MCOs, can begin to dissect, figure out the problems with, and figure out how they want to modify. Well said. Yes. Exactly. But these numbers don't count for 24. Nothing's being proposed. Right. This is not a proposal. Right. This is a sharing of information, and we're trying to make it real. <laughs> but they're forcing the natural supports that aren't there. Is actually carried out in practice. Perhaps in retrospect, I should have shared information from another state to make it less personal. But I mean, the bottom line is here, this isn't being proposed. This is to help you understand it. So then when it comes time to make a proposal, we'll have that common understanding of what it is we need. And then we can have this sort of debate. Yes, sir. Right. If I understand, right. uh, I'm trying to understand slide 12. And I understood you to say that these are, uh, your examples are more of the primary services, direct services, base services, and it's not inclusive of all services, non-based services. Uh, would care coordination be one of the non-based services, or is it Correct. Care coordination is not part of the SNL. Care coordination is not an administrative function. It's an administrative function, it's not, part of that. not part of the service, not part of the right. band or range right. cost. Okay. Thank you. If I could just add one um, thing to what your question that you asked before. One of the the things that we've seen states use once they have the SIS in place is that helps them to allocate their case, case coordination caseloads because lots of states have a requirement of 1 to 35 or 1 to 40 but it makes a whole lot of difference if you got 40 A's or 40 F's and partially to your point maybe if somebody's managing F's their caseload's 10. And if somebody's managing A's, their caseload might be 50. And I just, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here. I'm just saying that with the tool that you have in place for case management, it allows you administratively to make that kind of, a, and you can train people, your case, man, your case coordinators, into the kinds of specialized needs that those folks have. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question about this um, day support, 30-hour stuff. Is That's counting the transportation to and from the day support. So this six hours a day, five days a week is two hours a day on the van going to and from the day support program and three hours at the day support program. Because not all of us live here in Wake County where the day support program is 15 minutes from our house. So the concept is the, tra the day support rate incorporates transportation. You can't bill for that time. So this is six hours of paid support, which, being, which is in addition to transportation. Transportation is free. So they need to physically be at the day support program 30 hours a week, not including transportation. No, you can, as long as it starts or, or ends, it, as long as it originates out yeah. of the program, they can go out to the community. 
I think I understand. Because what I'm trying to understand, so I understand the tra that transportation is built into the day supports rate. What I'm trying to get at is the actual hours spent in transportation. Is that included in that 30 hour? No. So the res so this is where the residential provider makes out like a bandit then, right? Because well, we're crass enough to use that phrase, you're right, Mike. Okay. Because if I live rurally and I'm subject to a two hour a day transportation event, then if I'm the residential provider, I'm thinking that's not six hours a day at that residential program, that's eight hours a day. So now that's two hours a day. I'm not volunteering as part of my residential rate. I just made out, I just made out like a bandit, right? Cool. I'll let everybody know. Thanks. You were helpful. Any other questions? We're going to take a break in just a moment because this is a good transition point. But I want to ask if there's any other questions related to what we're talking about now, which is this refresh on resource allocation, because we're going to then transition to talk a little bit about some preliminary right. findings on our 14 claims analysis. Okay, so I have, I believe, 10 till 3. <coughs> I'd like to come back at 3 o'clock because there's still a, a fair amount of material here. <laughs>